Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online and I'm very pleased to be here today with renowned yoga teacher and author Doc Keller. Doc is one of the leading experts on the structural aspects of yoga and yoga therapy. And he is really a lifelong student of yoga. Doug, I keep wanting, wanting to say that you've been studying yoga since you were in your mother's womb, but that's probably not completely correct. No, not quite. <laughs> not quite, almost. But you were able, you were out early enough that you have background in all the major systems of yoga, including Ayinga yoga and Asari yoga and Ashtanga yoga. And um, with Anusari Yoga, you were actually one of the first teachers introducing Anusari Yoga, as I understand it. Is that correct? Yeah, working with John Friend, he set forth a style, and I was one of the early teachers in that style with him. Yeah. And you're also the author of several books, very popular books on yoga, and probably one of your leading book is, uh, books is the Yoga as Therapy book, where you really go very deeply into the um, structural aspects of yoga therapy. And I think it's considered one of the great resource works on this area of yoga practice. Thank you. Yeah, I recently, or a couple of years ago, renamed it the Therapeutic Wisdom of Yoga because nice. people are finding the term yoga therapy so problematic in some cases. But Interesting. it's accurate to talk about the therapeutic wisdom of yoga. Yes. Yes, indeed. Indeed. And uh, last but not least, I should mention that Doc teaches worldwide. He's one of the most sought after presenters, both in the US and worldwide. And so we feel very, very pleased that you took the time to meet with us today. So welcome. Thank you. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, things that are relevant for all of us and particularly more relevant as we get older, which is uh, mobility, functional aging, and yoga practice in that context. And there's a saying that um, 70 is the new 65. And I think it's a true reflection that we do live longer than ever before, and we tend to stay youthful longer. So that's the good news. But then on the flip side, we also see more of the kind of problems that happen as the body begins to wear out, which is loss of mobility, arthritis, joint problems, and so on. And so one could say that it's kind of a double-edged sword uh, to get older and live longer if you're not really able to maintain our mobility and functionality. You look at all the texts of yoga and they're all about aging gracefully. I mean, every, every text talks about how this is helpful as you age, or sometimes they make the pro promise of overcoming old age, which might be a little bit of hyperbole, but at least they've got that on their minds to take care of the aging process. Yes, indeed. Um, and I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on how that happens, you know, particularly from the point of view of the structural aspects of yoga. Um, in your experience, has, does yoga have an impact on helping us keep our structural health longer, keeping mobility longer? And if so, how would that help? Well, it definitely does, and, and people have experienced the benefits from it. I mean, uh, part of what keeps the body healthy is simply moving, and at the same time, moving is not always enough. I think uh, where we experience the most wear and tear structurally is basically through a loss of space in the body, a loss of space between the bones, a loss of space in the joints, and with that, you have the, the wearing down of the cartilage, problems with the ligaments, and then that turns into problems of osteoarthritis or simply uh, joint pain, which becomes a vicious cycle because as you're in pain or experience arthritis, you move less, and then that shortcuts or short circuits the process by which the body heals itself, so the problems of pain increase and it becomes a vicious cycle. So there has to be some degree to which you maintain movement in the body and not just movement per se, but a, a wide variety of movement to keep the joints healthy. Even Moshe Feldenkrais um, 
located the problem of pain in the body as being a lack of variety of movement and not simply a lack of movement. Mm. Yeah. The nice thing about a yoga practice is, uh, even though we don't have to aspire to extreme ranges of motion, uh, yoga practice takes you through the many different possible planes of movement in the body that best keep the joints healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, that maintains the fascial system, it maintains the strength of the muscles just enough to keep the space between the bones and reduce problems of osteoarthritis and, and basic joint deteriorations that come with age as age usually brings with it a lack of movement or a narrowing of our range of movement, both of which I think are a large part of the root of the problem. Mm, yeah, and that's a very interesting uh, statement that you made in the beginning that um, the wearing down of joints and problems with mobility happen because of loss of space in the body. We usually just hear, oh, well, it happens because of arthritis, but we don't really hear, well, why does arthritis happen? So what do you mean by that? Well, as you certainly had Tom Myers speaking a lot on Yoga You Online and other people talking about the fascial system mm -hmm. and the way that we're understanding the body in terms of the fascia is in terms of tensegrity which, you know, there are models of tensegrity where basically you've got different sculptures that are composed of, of, of strings or wires or elastic bands with sticks in between. And none of these structural parts, none of the sticks actually touch each other because the tone of the strings making up the structure basically hold up the shape of the structure and keep the pieces apart. And our body's made up in the same way, our whole network of fascia as connected tissue actually holds the bones away from each other while allowing movement. And if there's a breakdown in that system from some aspects of the fascia getting overly tight or short or other aspects becoming too weak or too long, kind of uh, locked along, it decreases the space between the bones and as the bones start to rub together, then you have the deterioration of the cartilage. And, and uh, Osteoarthritis in particular develops from both the factors of the bones coming closer together, often connected with body weight as we age, uh, and also hypermobility of the bones. For instance, uh, my webinar is going to be about the knees and a primary cause of oste osteoarthritis in the knees uh, is hypermobility, especially from doing exercises like super deep squats or, or basically flexions of the knees that are too deep that bring the bones together and just start to cause an inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. And I think the purpose, to me, the purpose of asana practice or a central purpose is to maintain the integrity of the whole fascial system. The yogi spoke of it as prana rather than fascia in order to maintain space in the body to keep the parts away from each other and that's that whole concept of that tensegrity system that maintains the health of the body on every level organic circulation lymphatic everything nervous system yeah and it's not just the fascia that kind of uh, gets affected and dries out the muscles tend to also uh, lose tone and uh, lack of a better term, shrink. <laughs> yeah, they all come together because I mean, a better term is myofascia that recognizes that there's not a myo meaning muscle and fascia meaning connective tissue. And you can't draw a hard div dividing line between connective tissue and muscles mm -hmm. uh, because they're so interspersed with each other that to put them together in a single term biomechanically is actually a bit more accurate. Mm -hmm. And even the bones too, right? And yeah. to dry out and, and lose yeah. mass. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, so loss of space is a factor, but I also wonder if some of it has to do this lack of space, even with how we use our body, because we kind of tend to not really be very aware of how to carry ourselves, but just kind of hang on this structure and give in to the pull of gravity. Yeah. Yeah, we basically collapse into gravity. It's it's aging is a is an ongoing battle with gravity, and we tend to surrender a little bit too easily. I mean, gravity is there for our health because against the force of gravity, we actually have this sort of 
rebounding action of the body. When you tell somebody to stand up tall, they're actually activating muscles against the pull of gravity in a way that keeps the body healthy. But as we cease to keep this in mind, we kind of fall to the forces of gravity and we lose that sort of bounciness that we associate with youth. And uh, it is very much a factor of youth because we're more aware and active at that time. And over time, as we get tired or emotional factors come in, we just, to some degree, give up a little bit, which is unfortunate because we don't have to. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So how can yoga help? Is it teaching us to live better in our bodies or um, is there a basic impact on the structural balance of the body? I, there are many levels to it. I think the most fundamental level, which is closest to the meaning of yoga, is that the practice makes us more self-conscious. I mean, conscious and aware of our body and how we use the body and even what we're feeling in the body. And this is, I can't say it's unique to yoga, but it's certainly important to yoga because if you look at other disciplines of movement, they're often involved in either competition like sports, and sports is, you know, healthy thing to do, or even things like dance and movement where um, the purpose of the practice is actually extrinsic to the practice. You're trying to achieve a beautiful form in dance according to the ideas of dance, or you're trying to win the game. And often people learn to override the signals that they're receiving from the body in order to advance themselves in that discipline. And uh, Anybody who's gone through dance training as, as a young person will probably say at one point or another, they're told to or learn to overlook the pain and override the pain. Same in gymnastics for the sake of competition and for the sake of performance. And what's key in yoga is, I mean, however it's developed in the contemporary world, it's not really meant to be for show or for competition. Rather, it's a practice in which you listen more closely to the body and learn from the body and learn to move in a way that makes it to feel more healthy and alive to experience well-being. So it is a practice of listening more closely. And the discipline involves uh, both strengthening as well as lengthening, which I'd rather say instead of stretching, because all of that works with that whole tensegrative system. And most of the nerves and our body are located in the tissue of the fascia. That's where we receive messages of both where the body is in space, that's called proprioception, and also messages of pain called nociception. And we often disconnect the two, and yoga through strengthening and lengthening gives us a way to reconnect to our sense of being in the body and awareness of the body. And even in working with people therapeutically, uh, we look, first at both posture and movement patterns. And you can see the moment that the person becomes even a little bit more self-aware of what their posture is or what their movement pattern is, it immediately starts to shift for the better because self-awareness is the first step towards the therapeutic aspect of yoga because the body is a self-correcting and self-healing mechanism. It just needs the aspect of consciousness or self-awareness uh, for that system to work. And so often we're distracted by other goals or other purposes that we cease to listen. And you're kind of pulling the plug on your body's own system of self-healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful point. And I think once you get on the other side of 50 or 55, you realize there's like a new epidemic in your neighborhood and like all your friends getting knee replacements and hip replacements. Yeah, yeah I, I do find the most serious yoga students are actually the older yoga students because they realize how much they need to take it seriously and what the consequences are if they don't maintain a practice. Right. Yes, indeed. And I, I do think we do have a debate in the yoga community, however, whether or not yoga can help or hurt. So we have examples like, uh, you know, Jill Miller has been very public about, you know, her own hip replacement. And I think she in, in part contributed, attributes it to her very zealous practice, not just of yoga, but of physical activity. So um, where is the line? When does yoga help? When does yoga hurt? 
Yeah, well, it, I, even that testimony right there kind of points the question in the in the right direction. Is it the yoga or is it you? And and your our attitude and our approach to what we're doing, whether it's yoga or dance or sports or anything else like that, what are we bringing to the table uh, that really determines the effects of the practices for us? And certainly anything can be overdone. I always find it humorous, if not ironic, if you look at the first comprehensive text on yoga was the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, and it basically warns against doing too much yoga. And it says, it says too much effort destroys your yoga. And we do in our present culture, not just the present culture, but past cultures, as a matter of human personality, we tend to get overzealous. And so if, if one is good, then too much be, too must be better, and why not 10? You know, more is better, and so more and deeper and harder is better, and you start to lose the sense of the very purpose of the practice. Yes. And so it is interesting, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, as one of many texts, is warning against overdoing, and it contains more cautious, cautious cautions, saying, check in with what you're doing, check in with what you're feeling. It's not even saying, you know, let the teacher tell you you're doing it wrong. It's be self-aware, are you doing it in a way that's beneficial to you or not? Mm -hmm. And again, that brings us back to what I was saying is the essence of yoga is that quality of self-awareness, which is our responsibility. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has to be learned because in so many ways we've been taught not to listen and to override the messages. And students come into class and we tell them, listen to your body. And the truth is, we don't know how to listen to our body. And so the practice has to be a step-by-step -step reconnection where you learn to listen, uh, which means learning to yourself, listening to yourself even more than to the teacher. Yes. And sometimes it means the body forces you to listen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if that's the purpose of the practice, then I, it comes back to the question is, is it yoga that's hurting you or is it our misunderstanding of yoga and our attitude towards it yeah. that's hurting us? And if you weren't doing yoga, you probably hurt yourself doing something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can certainly attest to that in my own experience when I was yeah. just three inches away from a full split in Hanuman Asana. <laughs> That's when I got yeah, my worst yoga that. injury ever. <laughs> we've all done that. It's like just a little bit more. Yeah, just a little bit more. The head takes over. So, so what are the mechanics? So, you know, listening to your body is obviously, you know, staying within your comfort level of practice and within your intelligent edge is the way to say stay, um, stay safe in your practice. If you already have some degree of joint deterioration, what are the mechanics by which healing takes place and can healing take place at that point? I, again, I, I mean, the parameters of what's possible is different from case to case. And a lot of factors come into it, including what you do for your work, body weight, lifestyle, diet, everything else like that. Um, but basically, I mean, the body burns energy and in burning energy, it produces metabolic byproducts or wastes, or you could even call it toxins like lactic acid and everything else like that, which the body is designed to naturally take out of the tissues as these wastes are produced. And the system by which uh, the body detoxifies itself is essentially movement. It doesn't have a circulation system like, uh, uh, like blood. Uh, certainly we're finding that the fascia is uh, even the first layer of our immune system, even prior to the lymphatic system, as far as removing toxins and maintaining our immunity, and it functions through movement. It doesn't have any heart that pumps um, that cleansing system. And so there is a saying that I always refer to that Eric Dalton uses. He says, if you move, you'll keep moving. If you rest, you rest. Now, if you have especially when, when these byproducts start to build up in the tissues, you get inflammation. We call it inflammation arthritis. Mm -hmm. And the way in which those byproducts are removed from the tissues are once again through movement. And 
if we start to experience inflammation, we start to reduce movement because it's painful or the range of motion is limited. And again, that becomes a vicious cycle because the less you move, the more you have a buildup of these toxins in the tissues, which further exacerbates the arthritis. And so my point is basically some degree of doing something without overdoing is not only beneficial, but even vital. We had, we had a teacher at the studio here who taught classes for rheumatoid arthritis, and she herself had body-wide rheumatoid arthritis, and she was quite adamant with the students. I know this, she wasn't trying to hurt people, but she says, I know this is comfortable, I know it's sometimes painful, but you have to keep moving, because if you don't, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. And so you can't make promises about the parameters of how much it's going to help, um, but it's certainly you can give some sense of what will happen if you don't participate in the practice. If you do participate, things get better, and especially as you improve muscle tone, patterns of movement, muscle flexibility, all of that affects the fascial system, plus your very mood that comes with movement because moving makes us feel better. Anybody knows that. The times we felt the worse if you get up and go out for a walk and do something as much as you don't feel like doing it, at the end, you're glad for having done it uh, because so much else is going on in the body beyond what's simply happening on a muscular or structural level. All of that influences how you feel inside too and how the body responds. And so whatever the deterioration is that comes, I mean, the body's always going through some process of deterioration. The question is, how much are you supporting the processes by which the body renews itself. Once again, the range of possibilities start to decrease with age, but they don't narrow down to nothing. And we see plenty of examples of people that have maintained movement into late in life, and they have been able to maintain. When we talk about retaining uh, mobility in the body as we get older, of course, the major joints, the hips and knees are essential. And um, you have a course coming up on Yoga U on how to keep your knees healthy, both in your day-to-day -day yoga practice, but also longer term as you get older. Could you talk about that course and what you'll be covering? Yeah, we're going to be covering about three of the main problems that arise in the knees, uh, both early on and later. Uh, often in knee therapy, it's the knee is just treated as an extensor mechanism, which means they look at how the knee straightens and bends like a hinge. And the truth is the, the knee is more like a twisty hinge. The shin is capable of rotation relative to the knee. And a lot of the problems that arise in the knee uh, come from structural factors like like knock knees and bow legs. We'll look at that, uh, but also and especially because the, of the kind of twisting that happens inside of the knee in day to day life, in walking and in standing, and it comes from often an imbalance in the hips, mm -hmm. which translates down through the iliotibial band into the knees and other factors like that. And certainly, uh, yoga practice deals with actions that twist the knee or rotate the tibia relative to the femur. So we want to look at how to practice safely for the knee more beneficially, uh, but also to look at the common problems that arise with the knee, even apart from a yoga practice, can be addressed in a yoga practice to benefit the knee. Mm -hmm. And a lot of students have experienced an improvement uh, in the condition of their knees from following some basic principles, going through basic poses, particularly the standing poses. And so we'll be looking at seated poses, how to work well. The main problems we'll look at is, first of all, this very twistiness in the knee is called the tibiofemoral rotation or torsion syndrome, which is partly a structural factor, but also becomes worse with different problems like uh, the arches of the feet falling or tightness in the hips. We can do a yoga practice that reduces that torsion in the knee. There's certainly the question of um, hyperextension of the knees, what's the imbalance going on, and how can we practice pose in a way that tone the hamstrings in such a way as, as to reduce the hyperextension. Because mm. hyperextension of the knees uh, 
and the hypermobility that comes with it is one of the factors that's most related to osteoarthritis later on in the knees. Interesting. So, yeah, this whole idea of locking the knees is certainly problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll look at how to overlook the locking. Uh, we'll look at how to overcome the locking of the knees and to create yeah. better, better balance in the knee itself. And then there are problems of the uh, movement of the kneecap in the joint, which can wear down the cartilage. It's related to chronomalacia, which is the sort of Rice Krispies sound that you get in your knees. Oh, right, that's right, yeah. Also from a muscular imbalance, that's more typical of people with uh, forms of knock knees and bowed legs. We'll find actually the muscular problems of both knock knees and bowed bow legs are so similar that you could actually treat the two in much the same way to benefit. So it doesn't have to become so complicated, but we want to ha help the kneecap to track properly because most pain around the, or under the kneecap comes from an improper tracking. And that can be addressed, especially through the basic standing poses right. and some basic action. So those three areas, areas, the twistiness of the knee, hyperextension of the knee, um, as well as kneecap tracking are the main topics. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at people that experience stiffness in the knee or an inability to bend the knee more deeply mm -hmm. uh, is also related to this, related to the kneecap tracking. Interesting. And does it work from the bottom up as well? <clears throat> Do knee issues affect the hip? Yeah, particularly the <coughs> case is people that develop knock knees or what's called progressive knock knees most often arise as uh, the arches of the feet fall over time. As you get more pronated in the feet, that tends to contribute to the knock knees. And if you work with the abduction of the thighs and make the abductors, the AB ductors stronger, uh, it both improves the arches of the feet and starts to reduce the progression of the knock knees. Uh, wow. And so, yeah, you can work with the feet upwards and it's also, which teachers often do, it's also important to work from the hips downwards mm -hmm. into the knees. And so it's sort of a chicken and egg situation as far as where you want to start. Yeah. Sounds like another winning duck killer course. <laughs> yeah, there'll be a lot packed in there and, and a lot of basic yeah. ideas for practice that people can use. And also Excellent. just remedial exercises that a person can do during the day just to help awesome. maintain the knees. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us um, to talk, talk more about this really important topic. And we very much look forward to your course coming up you. very soon. All right. Thank you so much. Take thanks care. so much, Eva. Okay. Right. Bye-bye.